I'll, 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 be, I'll never work with you actually. So, I, I thought of doing this because there were two important 50th anniversaries last year. Uh, one of which was actually the, uh, the 50th anniversary of um, Yuri Gagarin becoming the first man in space. Um, and I'll let you into the little secret that at that time um, I was a bump. Because <laughs> last year was actually my 50th anniversary too. Um, so um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief run through. I'll tell you what, what it is. It's not, this is not um, terribly serious in depth thing, but it's a, a chance to show off a few pictures, cover a bit of history. Um, many of the pictures here I've taken myself. You can probably tell which ones I have and which which ones are taken by astronauts and telescopes and stuff. Um, but I'll start off with just a little bit of background, really, about, about how the whole business of the space race came about and, and there's several different strands of history came together effectively um, um, one of which was you go back to the 1920s then um, a chap called Robert Goddard was spending a lot of time in America um, researching the uses of liquid fuel rockets um, then of course um, came along World War II when rocketry was developed quite considerably by uh, German scientists as a, as a weapon of war, and actually I will tell you that my, my father actually has is one of the few people who has seen a V2 rocket explode. He, uh, he actually saw one explode over London in 1944, and he, and he told me all about the, the, the V2 rocket. Actually, it was, it was, um, although it was a weapon of terror, it wasn't all that good at being a weapon of terror because it travelled inward at a supersonic speed, so that if you heard it coming, you were okay. <laughs> um, because you know, if it's going to get you, you wouldn't hear it coming because the noise came after the bang. And, uh, um, post World War II, um, of course, the, the, the scientists were were captured um, variously by the Americans and the Russians and were put to work there. And of course, the whole uh, ideological difference. Um, between communism and, and capitalism um, became a big issue after World War II where you know, the two countries, the USSR, Soviet Union, and the United States that had previously been allies during the war against Hitler um, sort of went their separate ways and we had um, the Cold War. Of course, and, uh, of course, in 1945 also the Americans invented the atomic bomb and they had a monopoly in that for four years. And the atomic bomb was, was, was you know, a devastating weapon, but it became that much more lethal um, when both sides started building rockets with the intention of delivering said weaponry to cities without actually having to send pilots and aircraft and so over. Um, so what they call intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, they were developed during the 1950s. Of course, they were rockets that actually became part of the later space program. Um, but the real game changer was Sputnik, of course, and uh, I think um, many people have sort of heard the, the beep, beep, beep of, of, um, of Sputnik. The Russians actually succeeded in 1957 in putting a satellite into low Earth orbit, and this terrified the Americans, quite frankly. They, they hadn't realized that the Russians were that far ahead and capable of doing that, and this kicked off really what became the space race. That is a V2 rocket. That's a, a picture I did take myself. Actually, that's on it. Um, that's an exhibit at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station um, in America. I'll just explain briefly. Cape Canaveral Air Force Station is where it all kicked off, and it's a slightly different place from the Kennedy Space Center that was built a little bit inland, um, a bit further up the coast, um, at a slightly later stage. But this, we were given a guided tour of um, various. Things. This is a museum they've got. Um, near where the, uh, where the Mercury Redstone took off from. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, this is a B-2 rocket, and our tour guide was, um, you, you can only imagine how um, a guy from the American military would be. You know, this guy was built like a tank, and he had all these medals on here. And he was explaining, this is the B-2 rocket, and, and, he, and he told us, he said, what you're looking at here, you see, is that's the rocket end up at the top there, and he says, and this is the London end down the bottom here. <laughs> well, that was quite a nice way of putting it. That's, uh, that's the V2 that's kind of kicked things off. So, so Werner von Braun was captured by the Americans. Uh, he was one of the chief developer of the, 
um, the V2 rocket at um, Peenemünde in Germany. And the Americans actually sort of did a deal with him where they'd, uh, they'd kind of forget about the war crimes bit if he made himself useful. Um, whatever. So he started working on rockets. And the first thing that really came out of it was that in 1950, the Americans built a thing called Bumper. And what Bumper was, was a V2 with a second stage on it. It was just, you know, it was used the V2 as the main rocket and um, it had a second stage to take it further. But it wasn't space capable, but it was, it was capable of going higher than a V2. Um, the Russians had their own captured German scientists, um, but they didn't trust them to work on their own, so they put them under the charge of a Russian, Sergei Korolev, um, and he was in charge of uh, a Russian rocket design throughout the 1950s into the 60s. Um, he actually died in 1966, and I think part of the reason why, we'll see later, things didn't go quite as well for the Russians, um, was, that, was that his death kind of lost a lot of focus of the, 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 the rocket program. But one of the things that they did design was a thing called the R7 rocket in 1954, and the R7 was built solely as an intercontinental ballistic missile. It was the first ICBM. And unlike the American program, which we'll see has gone in several different directions, um, really all Soviet and Russian manned rockets have been based on the R7 in 1954. Um, they all kind of look the same. They're flared at the bottom. See pictures. Wow. So that's how people have happened. Sputnik, of course. The Russians really got out into a quite early lead on all this. Um, Sputnik on the 4th of October 1957. Um, Luna 1, they actually launched um, a, uh, a satellite that, that went to the moon. It didn't go into the moon or around the moon, it just went straight past, but that was a first in 1959. Um, 1959 also, they managed to um, send a spaceship that hit the moon. And in October 1959, they actually got the first pictures from the back of the moon, which is very different from the front of the moon. We've not ever seen anything like that then. And of course, the, the one that really annoyed the Americans, Yuri Gagarin um, became the first man in space aboard his rocket Vostok 1 in April 1961. I'll just throw a little line to the conspiracy theorists here. Actually, there is a, a sort of a, that because of what happened um, with, with the Soviet Union being notoriously slow to you know, release information and uh, um, I think even probably in recent years, new stuff comes out as to what really happened in those days. Some say that actually Yuri Gagarin was not the first man in space, but he was actually the first one to come back. Um, that they did actually have a, maybe one or two failures where they put guys up and they couldn't get them back down again. Maybe, maybe not. It's just too long ago under such a secret regime that it's difficult to, to really know the truth behind that. But, uh, but, Convention has it, Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space. Um, so the Americans, I suppose, had to, had to respond. You know, that's, that's Gagarin's rocket. You can see it's got that sort of flared bottom end that, that all Russian rockets have. That's um, the Huntsville Times, which is, uh, of course, that's Huntsville, Alabama, is where um, the, the Americans built their rocket engines under Werner von Braun. And this is totally terrifying, I find it. This, this is what comes back. This is the, um, you know, the, the Russian way of doing re-entry. One is it doesn't <laughs> splash down in the ocean, um, you know, like an Apollo, say, uh, but it, it actually lands in the middle of a field, um, in this, and it's this spherical cylinder with, you can see here, the parachute ropes attached to it. Um, if somebody offered you a ride on that, you'd probably politely decline, really, when you sort of don't think so, maybe. But, uh, there we go. Should have been a so, the, um, the Americans had to respond to this, and they did so, and they had various attempts at building rockets, some of which just exploded on the pad and whatever, but uh, um, this one was a success, um, in as far as it went, um, it's a, it was a suborbital flight in May 1961, um, Alan B. Shepard, who um, became the first um, astronaut to, to <coughs> that far, at least, um, on this Mercury Redstone rocket. See, this is the Redstone part with the actual booster here, and this is the Mercury capsule 
There and, um, and on the top of here uh, is, is the rocket that was supposed to pull the capsule clear if this goes up in smoke. And there was a very real possibility that it didn't happen to, to Alan Shepard, of course. But um, just a couple of things there. Here he is. Here's the man himself, Alan B. Shepard, who was also later on to become the fifth man to walk on the moon. Um, and I've got lots of pictures, but here's just one of some of the computer equipment involved in, in um, the, the, the guidance of this here rocket. And it's an interesting fact there. Um, did you know the processing power of all computers on board a Mercury mission is now available in a $30 wristwatch? Because that's how far technology's come on. It's, uh, but, it, but there's banks and banks of it that, you know, on, on the ground station that wouldn't fit in this room. And um, it quite a lot goes in the, in, in the redstone market. So, let me just see if I can make the technology work. Um, the Americans needed to do something big. And so it was that John F. Kennedy took the best advice that he could get about whether to go to Mars, whether to build a space station, whatever. And he did this talk. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. That was actually the point where he was speaking to Congress and asking for the money, uh, which, uh, was, uh, which was a lot of money, but many say we got it back when his time's over. So. Um, the Mercury project moved on, um, used a bigger booster. This is, the, uh, this is the Mercury Atlas here. This was capable of going not just 15 minutes at subsonic, but right into orbit. And um, John Glenn on Friendship 7 um, achieved three orbits of the Earth in February 1962, and that got the Americans very much back on track. This, by the way, is, um, it's, is real. It's the, it's the Mercury Gemini control room. Uh, mission control, you're probably more familiar with, was in Houston, Texas, but this was actually at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and now forms part of the museum at the Kennedy Space Center. That's the, that's the um, uh, mission control for Mercury and Gemini. So Mercury and Gemini, Mercury um, was all about just getting into space. Um, and there were four orbital, two suborbital flights in space and then moved on to Project Gemini, which was a, like a Mercury capsule, only bigger, because it had two people in it. Um, and what that was all about was learning how to maneuver in space, do docking, um, go outside, that sort of thing. And that was actually um, 10 man flights over the period 1965 and 66. Uh, there was test flights in 62, 63, 64. Um, and a lot of work was done there, and a lot of the astronauts that went to the moon actually came out of that program, uh, most notably Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, uh, but many of the others too. Um, in Russia, they were still having their successes, and this is um, their first EVA, extravehicular activity, by going outside in space, and this was the first spacewalk ever um, by Russian Alexei Leonov on the 18th of March, 1965, and uh, um, this, is, this is his spacecraft here, and this is actually Alexei Leonov on his first spacewalk. Um, and the, the, the way that nearly all went completely wrong is that he found that as he went out into the vacuum of space, his suit started to expand um, due to the air pressure in it, and he couldn't actually get back in the hatch. So he had to do what I would do with great trepidation, I think he actually had to start letting the air out so that he could shrink the spacesuit enough to get back in the hatch. Quite terrifying stuff in those pioneering days. There's a, there's a Gemini, that's actually Gemini 2, which was unmanned. Um, that's again an exhibit in, uh, in the museum in Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Um, and you can see actually that's, that's, the, that's the heat shield, and that was really the purpose of the mission, was actually to test out the heat shield. They just put it up and dropped it back down and um, the heat shield obviously survived the trip. Um, unusually, this one is a US Air Force mission, not a NASA mission. Um, curious that, I'm not quite sure why that is, but uh, it's a bit odd that that's a US Air Force. Um, 
And again, catching up, the Americans got outside during Gemini. Ed White, who sadly was, was uh, later um, killed in the Apollo 1 fire, he um, did the first American spacewalk, and here he is doing it. And that's a very fisheye view of the inside of the Gemini capsule. You see that there's just about room for two people here and loads and loads of switchgear and equipment. There was, um, they, they were still at that stage recruiting their astronauts to small, you know, to, just to fit in the spacecraft. Um, another big milestone, um, first successful docking in space. Um, and uh, Neil Armstrong came out smelling a rose. This probably this it was this mission that secured his place um, on Apollo 11 because he had shown himself to be an expert in, in docking spacecraft together. Um, and, uh, and actually, it was Buzz Aldrin was the other guy who who was the expert at the maths behind it. You know, they, 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 so between the two of them, there was probably an obvious choice to, to be the first moon walkers. Um, <coughs> Project Apollo, having gone through Mercury, they moved out onto, onto the next thing. Project Apollo, a three-man craft designed to go to the moon. Now, they have been working on this since 1962, and really the design wasn't finalized and such. There was a thing called a Block 1 spacecraft, and Apollo 1 was a Block 1 spacecraft. And the difference being that, that they hadn't, because they hadn't figured out the exact mission parameters, i.e. the use of the lunar module and so on, you know that. Um, a Block 1 spacecraft had certain fundamental design differences like it couldn't dock to a lunar module, which was a fairly crucial thing. But one of the worst bits was that the door opened inwards. And that turned out to be very bad. Also, it worked on a pure oxygen atmosphere. And these things came together that both they were, they were sat on the pad, Launch Complex 34, uh, Cape Canaveral, um, a fire started and all three astronauts, uh, Ed White, Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee were killed um, actually in a fire on that pad in, um, in January 1967. And this really put things back a long way. Uh, it was a great set, back of a terrible tragedy of course. Um, so, yeah, that's the inside of the, of the Apollo 1 capsule um, post-fire, though they obviously didn't stand a chance in that. But, uh, they went away and made many, many changes, um, but they also needed to, to speed up the timetable. Uh, that, this is where it happened, that's what's left of it now. That was actually, I took that um, just um, um, September 2010, I was in Florida there. And um, they've taken away all the iron mong, they've just got the concrete structure um, of Launch Complex 34. And you can see here that these, um, they're actually on rails and they bring in um, the flame deflectors um, to, to sit there as, as required, we've got two of them. But uh, a very sort of um, sad place to go. It does actually say they're abandoned in place, so that will be staying there forever, but not to be used again. Um, but they needed to get back on track to meet John F. Kennedy's goal, uh, the target to land men on the moon by 1970. And they, Redesigned the Block 1 capsule, um, made many, many changes to it, including making it possible to dock a lunar lander to it. Um, the door opens outwards, we'll see one later, but it does. It? Um, and the atmosphere was, was, was um, reverted to, to air, not pure oxygen. Um, they also needed to, to actually test a mission, and they built the first Saturn V rocket. And rather than test every different part of it, um, you know, the, the three stages and the, and the command and service module separately, what they did was they built a mission called Apollo 4, and the purpose of it was what they called all-up testing. And that's where you build a mission that does everything and tests every separate part in one go. Um, it was a very ambitious project, excuse me just a moment. Um, and what they did was they launched the, the rocket, and it was the first launch to be done from the Kennedy Space Center, um, Launch Complex 39A, as it's still no, it's still there. Um, the rocket launched from there, all three stages fired, um, it then went off into a very high orbit, where they actually fired the rocket again 
with it facing towards the Earth, and that simulated a lunar return at 25,000 miles an hour, and then they actually dropped the capsule and retrieved the capsule, and so they tested out everything from the heat shield back to the, the initial rocket stages. So, but the great thing about Apollo 4, I'm going to show you a piece of video in a moment, is that nobody had ever done anything like it before. This was the biggest rocket that man had ever built. And although they were three miles away, um, the reporters who saw this were quite sort of gobsmacked by the whole thing. Because something about Apollo 4 that was different from every other Saturn V launch is that they hadn't actually seen the need for uh, the use of vast quantities of water to reduce the noise and vibration uh, when, when the rockets fired up. And so I think this is a very rare piece of video that I've had for some while. Um, and it's really quite entertaining to listen to. Now, I'm going to just be careful with the volume here because it might be uh, a bit too much. Good morning. Behind me is the largest single object man has ever attempted to lift off the face of the Earth. Its official designation is Saturn V. It stands as tall as a 36-story building, and though it is unmanned for this flight, this is the monster rocket with which America ultimately will place men on the moon. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 5, 4, we have ignition. All engines are running. We have lift off. We have lift off at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. <coughs> the tower is now a very big shaky day. A very shaky. So that was Apollo 4, and it worked perfectly. Um, and they actually only tested one more um, Saturn V, which was Apollo 6, before they said, yep, that's fine. Actually, Apollo 6 wasn't quite perfect, but they sort of took the view that, um, as they knew what the problem with it was, that was OK. <laughs> it was a slightly sort of gung ho thing. But then they actually started the moon missions properly with Apollo 7. And Apollo 7 actually was a, was a low Earth orbit mission. It didn't go past Earth. And so, and so it just used the smaller Saturn 1B rocket, and that's a Saturn 1B. Um, that's at the Kennedy Space Center. 
Um, and I took that a long time ago, actually, in 1994, because there's now a big wall along here. You can't take that picture anymore. Um, Apollo, Saturn just, uh, sorry, Apollo 7 just tested out the, the, the new Block 2 capsule. It's in action. Um, no lunar module. Um, then they came to do Apollo 8. Oops, actually, I'll talk about something else just briefly. At the same time, the Soviets were trying to build something equivalent to a Saturn V. And indeed, they did. They built the M1 rocket, um, which I'll just mention a bit in passing. This is slightly shorter than a Saturn V, that is to say, it's about 350 feet tall. But it has five stages, and it is more powerful than a Saturn V. In fact, Saturn V turned out just over 7.5 million pounds of thrust. Um, this turned out 9 million pounds of thrust. Um, however, unlike the Saturn V, they only ever built four of these, and they all blew up. Um, none of them actually got past got to the end of burning the first stage. And the reason being, as it turns out, they have, um, rather than five huge engines like a Saturn V, these had 30 smaller engines. And such was the complexity of all the plumbing um, and the vibration of actually trying to keep 30 engines firing um, at the same time that inevitably something would go wrong before it burned all the fuel in the first stage. And so it happened with all four of them they launched, and at which point, that was 1972, so they gave up on uh, it. But um, pretty tragic sort of uh, end there. People were killed as the debris came down in the control centre and stuff like that. But, uh, um, so not a great success, the end one. Apollo 8, on the other hand, was a brilliant success. Um, the mission came about, they didn't actually have um, a lunar module to test. And what, because of what Apollo 8 was supposed to be was what turned out to be Apollo 9, which was taking a Saturn V and the lunar module and everything into Earth orbit and just testing it out there and doing all the docking and undocking and so on. But they didn't, at the time of Apollo 8, have the lunar module ready. So they said, well, I'll tell you what, let's send three guys around the moon. And that's exactly what they did. Um, Borman, Lovell and Anders spent Christmas 1968 in doing 10 orbits of the moon. Um, they were supposed to take loads and loads of pictures of, of the uh, chosen landing sites and one of the pictures that they did not have on their itinerary was this one. Um, they just looked out the window, um, saw that picture and thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll take this because, you know, it looks pretty good and probably kicked off the whole ecology group in one photo. That's pretty impressive. So, two more Apollos before the big one. Apollo 9 was taking the whole lot just to low Earth orbit. Saturn V, lunar module, ground service module, docking, undocking, all that sort of stuff. Um, and of course, coming back in the capsule, splash down and all that. Apollo 10 was the whole dress rehearsal for the landing on the moon, doing everything except actually landing the lunar module. In fact, they got within eight miles. And um, had to come back home again because that's the mission parameters. Probably they could have landed. And just a little record that Apollo 10 set. Um, because Apollo 10 was carried out at the time uh, that the moon was furthest away from the Earth or thereabouts, um, the Apollo 10 astronauts have been further away from Earth than anybody else ever. The record still stands. Today. So Apollo 11, that's not Apollo 11 because, of course, Apollo 11 um, is in various pieces. In, Places and burnt up in space. That is Apollo 18, approximately. And I say approximately because not all of the parts are quite what would have been Apollo 18. Um, you know that the actual missions ended at 17, so they had the hardware left. But that's at the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston, Texas. Uh, it is no longer out in the front lawn like that. It is in, it's now in its own building. And I took that photograph in 1995 when I was um, in Texas. And just to see the architecture of it, you've got the big first stage here with the five engines on the back, then the second stage with five more engines, um, a single stage uh, engine here, sorry, there's that, yeah, and, um, and then the command and service module here, and in this area here is where the lunar module is stored. So when they get to a certain point and they've jettisoned all three stages here, they do a little bit of a turnaround and come and pull the lunar module out there and then jettison this shield. 
here. So that's um, what has happened. Five looks like the wrong, the wrong way up. It should be pointing upwards, of course. Um, but it is 360 feet long. So it's, um, when it's standing on its end, it's the same height as the Falls Cathedral. That uh, is Mission Control in Houston. <coughs> and um, this was the old one still being used by the shuttle, which was actually being replaced at the time that I was there in 1995. Um, just a little thing to understand about the way that all these missions work is that there's loads of engineers doing loads of stuff um, monitoring telemetry for all the individual systems on these screens here, but so as not to confuse the issue. There's only one guy called the CAPCOM, Capsule Communicator, who talks to the astronauts. Everything goes through him. Because you can imagine that if the three astronauts were trying to talk to all these guys, uh, it would be absolutely mayhem. So what they do is they nominate the guy in the CAPCOM who does all the talking to the astronauts. That's Mission Control Houston. That's not a Apollo 11 either, but it is Apollo 14. And that's, and that's the um, Block 2 Apollo capsule. That is the real Apollo 14 that took um, uh, Alan Shepard to the moon in 1971, and you see the door opens outwards, unlike the uh, original Apollo 1. Um, many other differences about it. That is, that's the real thing that's got uh, millions of miles on the clock, though, and it's <laughs> pretty good and performed faultlessly. Uh, this is the inside of the lunar lander, and you can see all sorts of controls here. It's, if you've sort of flown a plane or anything, you'd be familiar with this sort of setup. Shows you actually you know, that the, uh, the craft is level and so on. It, it also has a thing called an attitude controller, and I can think of one or two people that could do with it. <laughs> 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 I don't did find out what it actually does. But, uh, that's, that's the inside of the lunar module. And here's a, a couple of pictures um, from on this, um, from Apollo 11. That's that is Buzz Aldrin and landing on the flag with all the footprints there that um, um, you can see in pictures allegedly now. From satellites and so on. Um, this is the inside of the lunar module. Again, that's this control panel we just looked at. Um, and so the story goes, um, there's somewhere along there is a crucial switch that ignites the engine to fire the rocket to, um, to take the lunar module off the ground. And uh, Buzz Aldrin broke off the end with his suit on the way out, which is a, a bit scary. But fortunately, he had a pen on him, which he was able to stick into the switch and turn it on. Scary stories coming out of this. Now then, here's um, Apollo 11. That's Apollo 11 landing. Hang on a second. Oh. Oh. Sorry, that bit's broken. That was just the usual sort of, you've probably seen it all before, the landing of Apollo 11. Um, Footing video and PowerPoint isn't necessarily working on Anyway, rest of the Apollo missions. There were three more missions, really of the same sort of spec um, as Apollo 11. Um, Apollo 12 landed on the moon um, in December 1969 and stayed a little bit longer than Apollo 11, just 31 and a half hours instead of 21 and a half. Um, Apollo 13, as we all know, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but it's a fantastic film. Go and see the film, i say about Apollo 13. Um, brand new a successful failure because they didn't lose the astronauts. So despite um, an oxygen tank exploding on the way to the moon. Uh, Apollo 14 of 1971, um, again, stayed a bit longer than Apollo 12, so you get the general uh, drift there. That was, that was Alan Shepard's return to space. Remember, he went on the 15-minute Redstone flight um, in 1961. He didn't go into space because he had an ear infection um, that affected his balance a bit, and, but he got all that sorted out, and they let him back into space 10 years later. Um, as commander of Apollo 14. And he actually, in the meantime, he ran um, with Deke Slate in the astronaut office that actually allocated all the, um, the astronauts for various missions. Okay. Um, three more Apollos. These were all longer missions. They had the lunar rover, and they did a lot more actual science and collected lots of rocks. And, and the last Apollo, Apollo 17, uh, December 1972, um, was, was the longest one on the moon, the one that brought back the most rock um, and actually had a geologist on board, which was, uh, which was great. But unfortunately, the program ended there, and that was um, Duke Cern and Stuhl being the last man to walk on the moon, um, even now. So that's Project Apollo. 
That is the lunar rover. That's uh, which, which the last three missions had with them. So they built Skylab. Um, Skylab <coughs> was built out of Apollo 20's Saturn V. Okay. Quite an early stage, they cancelled Apollo 20 and said, we'll have the Saturn V and make it into a space station. That's exactly what they did. Um, they put that up unmanned on a Saturn V, and then they had three manned missions, all with Saturn 1B rockets, because we're only going to low Earth orbit here. Um, <coughs> and actually did some very useful science on Skylab, although it was, it was damaged on the way up, so the first thing they had to do was fix it. Um, Skylab was supposed to stay where it was until the 1980s. However, um, what happened was that an unusually high solar maximum in 1976 or thereabouts pushed the Earth's atmosphere out a bit further than expected and slowed down Skylab's orbit, such that Skylab came crashing back to Earth in 1979. The plan had been that the space shuttle would be ready by that time to go up and feed it some more fuel and push it a bit higher. Um, but the first space shuttle didn't launch until 1981, so it didn't happen. So Skylab just crashed into Australia in 1979. That's a couple of pictures of Skylab. That's a, that's a, that's a model of, of the craft. Um, this, is, this is the actual lab bit here. Um, and you can see there's, a, there's a, an Apollo command service module docked to it there. And this is the inside of it. They've got a full-size mock-up of this at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, with actually quite a bit of space in it. There was one last Apollo, which was not Apollo 18, it was the Apollo Soyuz test project, where they put a Saturn 1B with an Apollo capsule up and docked it with a Russian Soyuz. Um, so, so I have seen this documented as Apollo 18, and there was no <coughs> Apollo 18. There definitely was no Apollo 18 as depicted in a recent film. And I will tell you about that film, I will tell you all you need to know about that film. I watched it so you don't have to. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's an hour and a half of my life, I'm going to get back. <laughs> so, um, here's the space shuttle. I wonder if this video will work. No, it's not video, it's broken. So, never mind. Do you know what a space shuttle takes off looks like? Well, I'll say that uh, that, was, um, that was STS-1, the first space shuttle. And this took the all-up testing ideology to an extreme of, of things that even Apollo 4 didn't do, and that's that they actually had to launch the whole craft and bring it back, because it had to have two pilots on it. Um, I'm not sure that I would like to have been John Young or Bob Crippen, the two pilots. Um, so, so this this aircraft has never flown before, and we wanted to go and test it out. Um, yeah, uh, but it was fine, actually, as it happened. Um, I have read somewhere that there was a fault, that had they known what it was, they would have had to abort the mission with the loss of the craft by the mission rules. But as they didn't know what it was, it wasn't a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they went up and they came back just fine. Um, just to take you through the, the, the rough anatomy of shuttle missions, I shan't go into too much detail about any of them in particular, but um, the, first of all, the three space shuttle main engines fire. And six seconds later, if all is well, the two solid rocket boosters fire, and it goes up. Um, and then just over two minutes into the flight, the solid rocket boosters separate, and the whole thing is now light enough to be driven by those three engines and the fuel in this tank. Um, then when the fuel has run out of jets in the tank, um, the orbital insertion is done by two other engines on the rear um, craft, and that is so that if nothing works at that point, it is still possible to get the spacecraft down um, and land on a convenient runway somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, then they do what they do, their missions, nine to 16 days or so, then they face the other way, fire those rockets again, and they come back, um, and they fly round and round in circles, that's what the Scooby-9 is, and just basically they've got to lose 17,500 miles an hour and get it down to about 400 or so where they can land on the runway and stop with parachute. It's all um, very elegant in theory, but actually it's full of different points of danger. But uh, I've got some pictures just of a, of actually it's a, it's a mock up. Which I think that's the cargo bay with a, with a satellite stowed in it. Um, 
carried her on, seen the robotic arm, but this they actually pulled the spacecraft in and worked on them and then put them out again. That's the flight control deck of a, of a shuttle. And that's a real one on the pad, I saw that one. That's Discovery in <coughs> September 2010. Um, and it's, there are two different views, and I'll show you the other one in a minute, that you can get. I was very lucky there that I'd seen on the local television that they had rolled this out to the pad. And I figured that if I got down there early enough in the morning, they wouldn't actually have pulled the gantry right round it. Um, so you'd actually see it, and I was quite right. So we got on the tour there, and, uh, and that, we saw Discovery on the pad there. Um, the better view, this is from about half a mile away. The better view is actually from the other side, but you can't get closer than six miles. So you get that, um, which, which is the right side of the, of the spacecraft to see it from, um, but a lot further away. This is a great model, because um, I think of all the missions that the Space Shuttle did, the best one has to be those, those relating to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, obviously, I'm slightly accepting the building of the International Space Station, but I do think that us as astronomers have, you know, have got so much out of this space telescope um, particularly following its service missions that have brought the cameras up to date and everything. We've got this great model, you can see how they've hauled it in with the Canada arm here. Um, they've actually parked it in the cargo bay, and they've got the astronauts here working on the equipment, upgrading the cameras, making Hubble take better pictures. Two, I said that that, that flight profile was dangerous, and it is, um, mostly at the time of takeoff and at the time of landing. Um, Unfortunately, one shuttle was lost each way um, in 1986. We'll remember where we were, I suppose, when Challenger um, exploded at um, um, 73 seconds into the mission. And an O-ring in the solid rocket booster failed and actually burned its way through the fuel tank and exploded, killing all seven astronauts. I think it's probably true to say that the, that the explosion did not kill them, the impact of the ocean did. Um, and at the other end of then Columbia, of course, in January 2003, was re-entering the atmosphere, having been damaged by falling frozen foam on the way up, and it had actually no effective heat shield on the left wing, so the wing burned away, and um, 15 minutes before landing, uh, having completed the entire mission, STS-107 broke up over Texas, so two, two of the five shuttles built uh, lost in accidents, which were a couple of great. I mentioned Mir briefly, the Russian space station, um, because it set all of the records in long periods to be spent in space. Um, it was at the time, 1986 to 96, it was built. Um, it was the largest thing that we actually put into orbit. Um, and a lot of the work, but people forget this, that, that at the time that Mir was being built, um, the Soviet Union fell and became Russia. And this era of cooperation began. And actually, a lot of the parts of Mir were taken up by the space shuttle Atlantis, which I think is quite ironic given you know, the race that had taken place before. Um, but Mir, <coughs> thing, there's, a, there's Mir docked to Atlantis. Um, and uh, took us a long way forward, Mir. Did anyone see um, Michael Fold down at Armar when he was uh, mm -hmm. talking about his time on the, on the two craft? Quite a fantastic talk that one, I enjoyed it. Then, of course, it's the International Space Station. I'm not going to talk too much about the International Space Station because it's such a big subject that it needs a full talk of its own. But I think it's terrific to say about the Space Station that, that it's meant that since October 2000, there's always been people in space. Um, and initially, it had a three-man crew, and uh, in the last couple of years, was, has been upgraded to have a six-man crew. Um, they're doing uh, good science, um, you know, very good things, and, and now, of course, going up and down only by Soyuz rockets, which is also quite ironic in that uh, mm -hmm. the way things have gone. I'll just mention a few, couple other things um, before we perhaps take some questions. China has joined in the manned space exploration. Uh, since October 2003, uh, the, the Shenzhou rockets, Shenzhou 5, took the first Chinese man into space. Um, and they now even have what is currently an unmanned space station, as of last year, Tiangong-1. 
and actually crew are being sent up to that space station this year. So the Chinese are in on the act. I have a couple of pictures just there. That um, is, I forgot his name, it's Li, uh, yeah, oh, oh, Yang Li, Li Wei is, is the first Chinaman in space there. The Long March rocket is the craft that takes it up and it seems to, seems to work pretty well. And that's Shen Tzu Kai, the capsule that, uh, that came down bringing the first guys home. And the shuttle, we've lost the shuttle. The shuttle has been phased out, even though after Columbia they, they, they tightened up the safety so much that really it should have probably been done like that all the while before. But, but um, in order to actually keep the shuttle going long enough to finish off the International Space Station, they they upped the safety standards a great deal and uh, you know, had no real further problems after Columbia. Um, but actually the, 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 you know, the <coughs> brief called for the shuttle to be phased out as soon as the space station was finished. And so last year, the last shuttle, STS-135 Atlantis, took four men up. And in July last year, that was the end of the, of the shuttle program. Here is, here is Atlantis being greeted home on its last landing. So that's the end of the shuttle program. There was a proposed successor, Constellation program, using the, the two Ares rockets. Really, this was a sort of return to Saturn, with slightly different technology, um, in that they used a Skylab type idea where the big rocket took the stuff up and the little rocket took the men up. So it's a separate sort of thing. And um, really, uh, the Ares 5, which was never built, was a sort of Saturn 5 on steroids, um, using space shuttle solid rocket boosters and space shuttle type main engines. Um, and the smaller Ares-1 rocket, which they did build um, a sort of prototype of, the Ares-1X, the X signifying that actually it didn't have the top stage, it only had the bottom stage. But they tested that, it worked. Um, but then they just did, uh, decided to pull the plug. And the Orion capsule is like a super Apollo. I've got a picture of it here. Um, basically it's a six seat version of the Apollo capsule, and so they're looking there at, um, at not bringing this back like an aircraft, but returning to the old days of uh, splashdown parachutes and stuff. And that's the, there's, there's the Orion. You can see the, if you imagine a smaller one of those, it looks just like an Apollo, doesn't it? <coughs> yeah, so that's, that's abandoned from there. They've taken, this is rather short when I saw it, it was there, but uh, um, they've actually taken launch complex 39B, the backup thing, they've taken it to bits. Um, they're actually stripping it down. At that time, I was there in September 2010. So, leaves the question: Where next? Um, will the Americans uh, change their mind if they if they elect if they elect a new president later this year, or will India join China on the race, or will, they, will we perhaps, in the way that we've done an international space station, will we get together and have an international moon base? I'm thinking 50 years ahead, <coughs> realistically, and that's it. So thank you very much. That's a very potted history, but I think I've covered most of the bits there. Um, I know I've missed a couple of things, like salute out and stuff. But, uh, um, that's it. That's, that's 50 years in about 50 minutes. So thank you very much. Nostalgia there and uh, a few memories. Oh. Looking back, of course, was it true just as a matter of fact that it wasn't that battle on the outset of the, uh, the Apollo 11 catch up? As, uh, I, think, I think it was designed to, you know, to land and put them to let out. Mm -hmm. I remember Shawnee saying when I was giving this talk that um, lucky they didn't close the door while they were on the moon, but it was no harm to get back in again. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Just, just as a, I don't know anybody ever seen it, but there was a DVD out about, it must be four or five years ago, called The Space Race. Um, if you get your hands on it, it's, it's excellent. I think it was maybe a compilation of BBC programs, but it, it was a, almost an enactment of play, um, and it featured Don Brown and Korolov in it, and it was really, really good. So keep an eye out for that. It's well worth the watch. So a few questions for Paul. Yeah. The International Space Station, is it right that it has a five year life ago, five years ago? 
I think the current plans are to keep it going to about 2020 and then you know, determine what will happen there. Um, as long as rockets can keep going up to it and, and giving it a boost in its orbit, there's no reason for it to come down. Um, and we're still in that position, fortunately, with Troyer's rockets going up and, and the progress of life ships and so on. That's with collaboration with the Russians. Oh, yes. The Americans wouldn't, someone previously said, the Americans wouldn't share any information with the Chinese. That's why it's not an no. international space station because the Chinese won't be able to take part. Yeah. The Chinese are off on a tangent doing their own. So they're trying to do catch up again. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, the Chinese aren't involved um, for, for the, the reason you say, but the um, you know, secrecy thing. But um, as long as the, the, you know, the, the relationship with the Russians hold, they can keep saving sending people and, and supplies and, and you know, fuel up. So there's no reason for it to end within five years. But leading on, is there any chance that the Russians, uh, the Americans, will have to rely on the Chinese eventually? Don't know. I mean, I, I would like to think that the Americans will get themselves back to the, to the stage that they can rely on themselves, but uh, it depends. That one. That's, that's, that's politics rather than anything else. Context. Well, uh, you mentioned the speculation about other people being up for Gagarin. Um, and you said they might still be up there, but probably actually they would have come down. Yeah, you yeah. Can imagine. But at what stage did the Americans get? the technology so that they could monitor every single Russian launch and so no I don't know, actually, I don't know a lot about that. Yeah. Andrew, but I mean you're right that they would probably have been, you know, taking a close eye on these yeah. things. But um, I mean certainly the information that came out of the Soviet Union was whatever the Soviet Union wanted to tell mm -hmm. at the time. And so it would probably be quite difficult to to you know to say for example, to determine even by radar or whatever whether a particular craft was manned or unmanned, unless you were told one way or the other. So, yeah. so because even the British and the military society, which didn't have the resources of NASA, they seem to know everything about mm -hmm. every single Russian launch. Yeah. Maybe really not what was inside, yeah. but they had a rough idea yeah. of the, the rocket, the, uh, the orbit, and what mm -hmm. the, the launch uh, was. And so on. So they probably have to have a good estimate as to whether a man launch took place before uh, so, so does that put you in the camp of those who think that if that happened we would probably know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Personally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'm just commenting on yes. for yeah. the speculation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, I'm right. Because yeah. there, are, yeah. to me, there, are there were lots of people watching, you know, listening yeah. to the radio transmissions and all that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Well, was there any um, active planning for a Mars mission still going on? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, there is planning of sorts because there was um, there was recently these guys came out having spent um, 500 <coughs> days in a factory in Moscow, pretending they were going to Mars, but then it's, uh, um, of which actually I think the um, the actual objective was to determine whether they went army or not, you know, in, in, in that confined space, and, and uh, because they knew what they were doing, it maybe wasn't that really a test, but in terms of actually building the machinery to do it, I don't any closer than we were when I was about 10, you know. It's, uh, uh, I, I, I thought we'd have been there by now, and we'd, be, you know, we'd have a, um, you know, 500 people you know, living and working on the moon and stuff. Yeah. But uh, um, the future didn't turn out quite as rosy as I thought those days. Uh, Brad Harvey, who's one of the experts in this, was asked how these were the stickers at the Gold Star Party. And he reckons that the Chinese will be making an effort to be there by 2050 either on their own or in collaboration with the Americans, if the Americans will get to the stage where they'll work with them, as you say, at the moment they won't. I, I do think that Gene Cernan's record will be broken by China, yeah. probably within 10 years or so. William. Um, well, the Chinese does compare to the moon, they I would think India. I don't think that the Americans have the will to go back to the moon because they've been there. And it kind of makes it a bit more difficult to go back. Um, because the American, the, you know, the last American president, George Bush, he, he said, let's go back to the moon. And kind of, well, we've been to the moon. And the Americans may well go somewhere else. But I think if China goes to the moon, India will follow them. Stop 
Mars or they talk about asteroids actually. Um, putting, putting a man on asteroid, uh, on asteroid might be a, a, a viable thing to do. <coughs> Last question. Well, I refer to the fact that this continual presence of astronauts now in the, the space station with increased solar activity, which we experience at the moment and which could go on for a while and get even more active, do they have a good margin, a safety margin, in the event of things like that affecting them out there? There's things that they can do. First of all, there's certain parts of the space station that are better shielded than others that they can take refuge in. Um, then they do have um, a permanently attached Soyuz escape mechanism. So they could leave if things got that bad. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, if you look at it, this is, this is not quite the first time that we've gone to the solar maximum with the space station then. It's the second because, because in 2000, when they first went there, that was a fairly lively time on the sun as well, the first time. So two or three years over there was, was, was quite lively. So if this turns out to be a, a bigger solar maximum, then we're in uncharted territory. There are things they can do, and if the worst comes to the worst, they can get off. Go ahead, I mean, it's all, um, sometimes there's work there. Um, the famous Earth Rise shot from, you showed from eight, uh, from yep. Apollo eight. Yeah. It was a tree that was subject to a very bit of photoshopping, you might say. But tilted it by 90 degrees. As a, as the oh, well, it's, it's rotated, yeah, because when, yeah, because when they looked out the window, it would have been like that. Yeah, the yeah. ball was the <laughs> yeah. wall on the right yeah. side. Yeah, because they were, they were but, but then in space, which way is up? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. But in, in relation um, to the way we see yeah. that the, the, the moon rotating, the Earth was in its correct position yeah. in the original shot. Yeah. yeah, I don't think they've done anything you know, with that sort of thing. No, no. I don't think even tone brushes. I think. Uh, but it's probably, it's probably touched up you know, a bit since. <coughs> no, I just and, and there's a whole dispute about which picture that is anyway, because there was, um, because different ones can have different cameras at the time. And there's, you know, there's a particular one in Monaco, and that's, that's a slide for one. Wow. And there's some discussion as to which astronaut had which camera at the time. But I think the conventional thing is that Bill Anders took that one. Okay, that was excellent, Paul, as I say, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all again.